as we conclude our study this time anyway in the uh, book of James taking principal parts of chapters 4 and 5 we had previously studied this now we're sort of overviewing it in themes I guess I really should have read this before the contribution once there was a Christian he had a pious look his consecration was complete except his pocketbook. He had put a nickel on the plate, and then with might and main he had sang, When we asunder part, it gives me inward pain. Probably take a little more than a nickel today for that to happen. But. <laughs> James chapters 4 and 5 sum up this very practical, down to earth book. There's so many good points. He begins in chapter 4 with a lesson on prayer. You don't receive because you don't ask. And then when you do ask, you ask amiss to consume it on your own lust. Or it's even when you pray, you're covetous. You know, the Bible says, in everything give thanks, 1 Thessalonians 5. And then it tells us the context of that, rejoice evermore, and so forth. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Can you think of a place in the Bible where a person was thankful, but he was rebuked for it? How about the Pharisee in Luke 18? I'm thankful I'm not like other men. Self-righteous, arrogance. So he was thankful, but not for the right things. He's thankful for his own pseudo-greatness. But basically, prayer is for Christians, and one main expression of it is gratitude and appreciation for all the Lord has done. One of the great verses on prayer for Christians is Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. But James 4 begins, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust that war in your members? World wars have been started by covetous, arrogant rulers, dictators, who wanted more acreage, more power, more money, more prestige. And so wars, uh, whether on a one-on-one -on -one basis, a family uh, at odds with one another, or international war, a lot of times comes from lustful people uh, and the war, the inward war that is inside themselves. I know that of the 1,400,000 divorces granted last year, the vast majority of those would never have happened except for lustfulness and pridefulness and the desire for more personal gain. And then he says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, nor is you're restless. You fight and war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Some, some people receive nothing in prayer because they never pray. Then others receive nothing because they pray amiss to consume it on their own lust. They're not praying unselfishly. Uh, if people who are selfish would pray that the world might be saved and that they might have a part in that and get busy doing it, they wouldn't have time to be lustful and self-centered. So when prayer is offered because we want something, or because we're afraid, instead of to adore God and praise God and thank God for blessings he's already given, if we said thank you more and give me less, our prayers would be more effectual. For James 5, 16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the prayer of a selfish person doesn't avail anything. It doesn't get over the roof. A lot of times prayer is not productive because the one who makes it is not right in the sight of God. Prayer is not a crutch for sinners, but a blessing for saints. And then many times members of the church abuse it and still ask selfishly to consume it on their own lust. So when prayer doesn't work as we define work, guess whose fault it is? We need to come humbly, gratefully. And if we were to analyze our prayers, many times all we do is ask for more and more and don't say thank you for anything. I've heard a few prayers in my lifetime where nothing was asked, and all praise was given and thankfulness and gratitude was expressed. Prayer is the attitude of gratitude. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. And when you analyze many, many prayers, uh, have you ever found yourself praying because it's sort of your habit to pray, but pray for things you should never have prayed for? Uh, Lord, help him hit a home run right now. I just don't think he cares. But I have found myself praying for my team uh, because I wanted something to make me feel good. 
if I would stop and think of how silly that is, do you believe God cares who wins a ball game? I don't believe he does. I don't believe he's in either dugout. So many times our prayers are ineffectual because we ask amiss to consume it on our own lust. We should pray that the gospel would cover the world as the waters cover the sea. How evangelistic are our prayers? And then how specifically do we pray for those we are supporting from this congregation? We need to go to the throne of God in prayer on behalf of people we're supporting around the world. It's a great thing for a congregation to invest money in the salvation of souls, but let's invest some prayers back of it. Make our actions and our giving more productive. I think that's a very, very important point. Too many times people pray under pressure and the, God doesn't even recognize their voice. We could say that as an extreme statement because it's been so long since he heard their voice. And if the only time we ever go to God in prayer is for selfish reasons, we won't receive. So the next time we don't get what we ask for, we probably ought to analyze what we ask for. And then analyze, are we really fit to come before God's throne in prayer to expect uh, blessings? Again, if my people who call by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their wicked way. That's a whole lot of prerequisites there, Second Chronicles 7.14. It takes a whole lot of doing to get ready for that arrangement to where we have a right for him to hear us. And I know we've all prayed foolish prayers, selfish prayers, urgent prayers, and uh, kind of like the old boy in the foxhole in World War One. He was bullets whizzing all over his head, and he said, Lord, I ain't bod you for 20 years and won't bod you for 20 more if you just get me out of this crate. So people like that don't have any right to expect an answer as they want it. We ought to pray that when adversity comes, whatever it is, we'll still be faithful. And we'll still acknowledge God, whom we're praying to, as omnipotent, ever-present, all-powerful, all-wise, and that he knows best. And in James 4, 15, he'll say, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this and so. If we're not consciously under the will of God, how would we expect him to hear us and bless us when we occasionally, under pressure, cry out? But the other side of this, Revelation 8, verse 4 and 5, says the prayers of the saints come up as sweet-smelling incense before God in heaven. If you're a faithful Christian and you pray according to the scriptures, heaven hears you. Whoever on earth will not talk to you or listen to you, God does. He talks to us through his word and listens to us when we pray. We need to study the whole scope of what the Bible says about prayer. Some of the more effective, practical things that I've done in 53 years of preaching is when I was working locally with congregations. Uh, we would have uh, training classes for men. And one of the first things we did in Wisconsin, I was just barely 22 when I moved up there, had some real good men and anxious to do better and babes in Christ that really wanted to grow. And they urged me to teach them, I think it was every Monday night or Tuesday night for several weeks on uh, prayer and other things that men do in leadership roles in the congregation. And we spent quite a bit of time on prayer. And we went through the Bible and discussed every passage on prayer and every prayer in the Bible and uh, things that we should include in prayers and things that we should not include in prayers. Just because Brother Smith, Brother Smith at Possum Trot prayed something 30 years ago doesn't make it scriptural. We need to quit mimicking and just repeating what we have heard, which might not be scriptural or best. And we need to learn how to grow in our prayer life. Those who lead prayers and even in personal prayers at home, we need to develop a better prayer life by studying what the Bible says about prayer. I've told you before that I believe without equivocation the three greatest prayers in the Bible, which we ought to study for content and atmosphere, if you please, would be Psalm 51, David's prayer of penitence, after Nathan the prophet rebuked him. It's the greatest uh, passage and prayer on penitence in the Bible. And then Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's prayer on behalf of himself and the nation while in captivity because of their sins. It's a real classic. Psalm 51, the whole chapter, Daniel chapter 9, the whole chapter, and John 17, Christ's intercessory prayer, a whole chapter, which would really be the Lord's Prayer, not the model prayer of Matthew 6, but the Lord's Prayer, a lengthy prayer, an intercessory prayer to the Father, John 17. We can get some real good clues in those three chapters about humility when we approach the throne of God, boldness before His throne, and uh, how that we pray fervently for individuals and for the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. 
Uh, but if we'd start by reading those three chapters in, in their entirety, we'd have a better concept of the humility expressed and the open-hearted confession expressed and the desire and the plaintive cry of Christ on behalf of his disciples. An unselfish prayer, if you please. I do believe it would be good that one of these days I will preach a whole sermon on prayer and talk about these things and bring to mind the passages in the Bible on prayer and perhaps help us to do a better job of public prayer. Now, having said that, in no way do I denigrate or talk down to or condescend by saying that no prayers offered here are good, uh, that uh, we could do a whole lot better. I think we'd all agree. But if I were a person uh, called upon to lead a public prayer, I'd want to do the best job I could. And that'd be according to what the Bible says about prayer and coming before God's throne and to try to not just mimic what others have said through the years without even thinking about it. Uh, like when I grew up, nearly every prayer was ended, guard, guide, and direct us. And then the old brother threw in after asking for everything on earth, and Lord, that'll be enough. Well, it ought to be. He's asked for everything in heaven and earth. Not anything left to ask for. But uh, I grew up hearing those same things. And really and truly, if the man had dropped dead in my home congregation halfway through his prayer, I could have finished it word for word. He said the same thing every time he led prayer. And he usually prayed about 10 minutes. And he used two or three words. He was superintendent of schools. And he used a few words I never heard before. And in every prayer somewhere, he'd say, articulate. And I thought that's some kind of disease like hepatitis or something. But, uh, but the point is, we need to know what we're talking about. We need to improve in our prayers. And then every time I say this, men will sell up and say, I'm going to read another prayer. We need to grow in every way. We need to advance in spirituality. One thing that I have noticed here, in many, many of the prayers, we do take time to thank God for His blessings. A lot of people spend all their time, give me this, give me that, and give me some more. It's great when we just thank God for all He's done for us. We need to be humble when we pray, and yet bold. That may seem a contradiction, but it isn't. We're told, let us come, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. So many times we block our own prayers, sometimes by not living right, not having full access to the throne of God's grace, sometimes by just repeating the same things we've heard over and over and over again without any thought. Do we even analyze our prayers? So I believe one of these days I may have a series of lessons on prayer. And then in a practical way, talk about how we can improve our prayers, what to include in our prayers, and what not to include. It's amazing how we often do not include what the Bible tells us to in prayer, and often include things the Bible says nothing about. We're real top-heavy on praying for people who are physically ill, but not very strong on praying for those who are spiritually ill. Sometimes we throw in one little half sentence on those who are spiritually ill, and then we'll go on and on and on about people who are physically ill. Where in the Bible is an emphasis on praying for physical health? The emphasis is not there. Is it wrong to do it? No. But it's wrong to slight the other side, which is far more important. People who are spiritually ill are the ones that we ought to be deeply concerned about. And I'll say it one more time. Often we will call by name someone's father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, son, daughter, neighbor, friend, in physical illness, and never call the name of those who are spiritually ill. You may say, well, that'd be rude. That'd be embarrassing. It's embarrassing to me that so many members are so weak that we don't seem to care if they go to hell or not. That's what bothers me. I wish sometimes we'd say, bless Brother Smith and help him to come back and help us to help him to come back to the Lord before it's everlastingly too late. That'd be a lot more scriptural thought than going on and on and on about everybody's got the pink eye or runny nose in the Klondike. Well, I know that's almost blasphemous, but it's, it's true. So I guess true blasphemy it ain't bad. Verses 4 and 5 are two of the more difficult verses, not because of what the Bible says, but because of what brethren have written in commentaries. I've told you before, two brethren wrote commentaries in the same year, were published the same year on the book of James, and they differed on James 4, verse 5. And I know why they differed, because I know what both of them believed. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, and other translations say ye spiritual adulterers, know ye not that friendship to the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In other words, if your desire above all else is to be a friend of the world, you'll never be a friend of God. Paul said, am I yet 
a pleasing man? Am I persuading men? If I were, I would not be the servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. So for us to have our friendship mainly with the world, since evil companions corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15.33 means we have made ourselves an enemy of God. See, we're creatures of choice. I can either be a friend of God or an enemy of God. A friend if I do as well. In fact, if I want to do as well and do it. Freedom in Christ is the freedom to want to do what he wants us to do. You'll never be free otherwise. If you do it grudgingly, reluctantly, negatively, half-heartedly, it won't be a blessing. So we're going to have to understand that we're on earth to please God, not men. And he's saying you're a spiritual adulterer if you're always trying to be a friend of the world and not be a friend of God. But it's the next verse that was the controversial one that the two brethren came out on different sides of what it meant. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusts us to envy? See, one said, first of all, he said, the Holy Spirit only deals with us through the Word. That's his position. So his commentary was along that line. And he denied this this had anything to do with the Holy Spirit and uh, so forth. Uh, the other believes, as I believe the Bible teaches, the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. Uh, Romans 8, 26 and 27, help us when we pray. Uh, with sighs too deep for words, helps us in heaven, not on earth. Something he does for us in heaven, not to us on earth, but the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Uh, and I believe it's tantamount to Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3, where Jehovah, another member of the Godhead, said, I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, he jealously wanted us to serve him and him alone, not split that time with him and the devil. I believe that's what that verse is saying. That unless you're spiritually minded and your spirit is in concert with the Spirit of God, you're going to be worldly and carnal and not spiritual, and you won't deepen in the things of God. Uh, if one member of the Godhead is jealous over us, you remember what Paul said to the Corinthians? I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I've espoused you as a pure virgin unto Christ. In other words, the church at Corinth was impure. He said, I want the bride of Christ, and I introduced you to Christ to be pure and holy. And he said, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly, so also your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's the next verse, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. In other words, the Godhead yearns for us to wholeheartedly love them and not share our affection with heaven and earth, God and man, Jehovah and Satan. To me, that's definitely following verse 4, what he's got to be talking about. So uh, the point he's making here is you're going to be spiritually minded or worldly minded. Then let's notice, starting in verse 7, how that we're creatures of choice and have an ability to resist the devil and the ability to draw nigh to God. Why are so many members worldly? Why do some never darken the door? Why have some not been here but about once in the last 10 weeks? And that's pretty good uh, going for them. Uh, it's because they don't resist the devil. And it's because they don't draw nigh to God. I believe one of the greatest challenges I have as an individual and as a Christian is to make the right choices. I have the ability. I'm not a robot. I'm not a puppet on a string. I can choose to do God's will or I can choose not to do it. And it will not be God's fault, the choice I make. He sent His Son to help us make the right choice. He offers us heaven and the joy of Christianity here and now to make the right choice. And still some stubborn refuse. But I have the ability, and you do too, to be a free moral agent to choose your own destiny. Leviticus 1.3 in the King James translation says, Of your own voluntary will. I can volunteer to serve the Lord or volunteer not to serve Him. I make the decision. I make the choice. God voted for me. Satan voted against me. I cast the deciding ballot. So notice verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. That's a twofold responsibility. Submit yourselves to God. And that'll help you to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What happened when Jesus resisted the devil? The devil fled from him. And angels came and ministered unto Jesus. Matthew 4, verse 10 and 11. But Jesus first said, Get thee behind me. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. I'm not going to worship you, he said. You ought to worship God. And angels came to administer unto him. The devil fled. And so when we resist the devil, because we submit ourselves therefore to God, we have a head start toward heaven. But a lot of people invite the devil in, and some permanently. Right now we've got a member or two here that 
say the reason they don't come is they don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, it takes effort to be a Christian. It takes effort to be a hypocrite. The effort you put into being a hypocrite isn't worthwhile. It eventuates in hell and causes the Lord to say, Depart from me, I never knew you. So the same energy we take to be worldly is the same energy we could turn over to God and be saved and be fruitful and be helpful. I count as one of the greatest single blessings God ever bestowed upon humanity was their ability to choose. He didn't make a bunch of robots, puppets on a string. He made us with the ability to make choices. And it won't work in the day of judgment to say, look what you made me do, and it's their fault and somebody else's fault. It couldn't be my fault. And if I do anything wrong, it's my mother and daddy's fault anyway, or the teacher's fault, or the elder's fault, or the preacher's fault, somebody's fault. It couldn't be my fault. But the Bible says, uh, look to yourselves, lest you lose your own reward, Second John 8. The Bible says, keep yourselves in the love of God, Jude verse 21. So if I'm lost in the day of judgment, it'll be my fault. There'll be some people that helped me along that road to eternal ruin. But basically, I made the decision. I've had bad influences in my life. And for a while in my life, I followed some of them straight to hell. But thanks to my mother and dad and other people, godly people who loved me and cared for me, and the old aunt who wrote me a 12-page letter rebuking me when I was 17 or so to quit being a bad influence on her son and do what I was raised to do. And then at the end said, you might be a gospel preacher someday, Johnny, if you try. I preached a funeral and read that letter. And I said, don't you have someone you need to write a letter like this to today? I'm glad she took the time out to write to me. And her point was, you're living beneath your privileges. You're not living the way you were raised. I said, I've known your mother and dad from the day you were born. I know what they taught you and how they lived before you. And her own dad was an elder in the church, one of the dearest friends I ever had. And he had a gentle way of rebuking you, but it stung. And to my dying day, I'll be appreciative of him. But the point is, we have the ability to resist the devil. I can resist the devil. And you can too, as powerfully as he is. In Revelation 12, 9, here's what is said of him. He's that old serpent going back to the Garden of Eden, Satan the devil, the deceiver of the whole world. He's powerful. But two verses later, we can overcome him through the word of God, the blood of Christ, and by being willing to die for the cause of Christ. So as powerful and great and deceptive as Satan is, I can whip him with the help of heaven, with the word of God, the blood of Christ. That's why the demons believe and tremble, James 2.19. They know we have a powerful source, more powerful than they. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. All the way through the book, he contrasts the double-minded with a single mind of serving God. If you claim to be religious and brighten not your tongue, and then he tells us what pure religion is. Uh, he tells us about faith and works and how we need both of them. He tells about uh, bitter words that proceed from the tongue and pure words that give us the water of life freely. The difference between devilish wisdom and heavenly wisdom so all the way through here he talks about hypocritic living and genuine living pure religion and undefiled and then in verse 10 humble yourselves here's again an action on our part humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up so resist the devil draw nigh to God humble yourself in the sight of the Lord he shall lift you up if we go on our own strength and that alone will surely crumble into dust then as we come to the end of this chapter, let's notice verses 14 through 17. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? Is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanish the way. I used to walk three or four times Monday through Saturday and never walk on Sunday. I've been getting up earlier on Sunday morning and uh, walking, so I'll at least get one walk in, then to try to go after I eat at noon. But that early morning deal helps. But you know, it rained a little bit yesterday. It drizzled a little bit, and the uh, car had all that stuff on it. It had to wipe off to dry. To dry. Uh, and as I was walking in a certain place, there was a puddle of water there. And as I walked by, it started a little mist or vapor came up out of it. That's your life. It appeared for a little while, then vanished away. So James 4 came to life in my morning walk. And it illustrates and demonstrates and reminds us of how brief and uncertain and brittle our life is. It appears for a little while, then vanish the way. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. 
but now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, and that's a concluding word that ties what's preceded with that uh, which is now under command. Therefore, as a result of the brevity and uncertainty of life, how important it is to do God's will. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. So we're not to make big plans for tomorrow and the next day. I, ma I imagine that man who died last night had great plans for after the very first of his uh, triple bypass, the doctor said, you made this better than anyone we've seen. And within the next day, they were thinking about letting him go home. And then he deteriorated. And the doctor and nurse stood there and cried and said, we don't know, we, try, we tried our best. We didn't have any idea this was going to happen. We don't know what's going to be on tomorrow. And so uh, when we know to do good and do it not to him, it's sin. When I lived in Austin, a man who had been in the Navy, I know they gave him a military funeral, started hearing me on radio, and then he came a time or two. He called me often, and then he got real, real sick. Then he was about to get well, and finally they let him go home. He asked me while he was in the hospital and told his folks, none of whom, himself included, was a member of the church, he wanted me to do his funeral. He called me one day and said, I'm going to be there tomorrow. I'm out taking my walk. I'm going to see you tomorrow, and I'm going to obey the gospel. Coming back from that walk, he dropped dead in his driveway. Here I am, going to preach his funeral. Never met any of his family. Talked to his wife on the phone. They taped it to send to the folk back in South Carolina where he came from. I hope they listened to what I said. And he knew what I'd say. And he wanted me to preach the funeral. That's, that, those are hard times. Rough times. And I sat there while they were giving the 21-gun salute and the chaplain was folding up the flag and so forth. And I thought, there's a fellow that knew the truth and tended to obey it, told me he was going to, wanted me to preach his funeral when he did die. He wasn't even a member of the church. That's hard. So he never got around to doing what he purposed to do, what he intended to do, what he had opportunity to do. Died outside Christ. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. James chapter 5, he rebukes the rich men who gain their wealth by robbing those who work for them. I think it's interesting, and we'll notice tonight in 1 Timothy 6, the Bible several times, half a dozen times, talks about masters and servants, owners and slaves, and how they're to act and react with one another. If you're a Christian who's a slave or a servant, be the best servant your master ever had. If you're a master, remember you have a master in heaven, and you'll give answer to him. Here are rich men who rob the people who worked in the fields by holding back and the, for garments that were of value and silver and gold that cankered. And the clothing was uh, moth-eaten. He said, and you're like the cattle out there on a thousand hills, partaking of the grass of the field continually, and tomorrow your neck chopped off in the slaughter. He said, the Lord's going to come swiftly and suddenly upon all mankind, and we need to be ready. But let's notice beginning in verse 7 of chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, <laughs> under the coming of the Lord. Behold the husbandman, and that's the one who's been placed in charge of another's treasure or vineyard, the parable of the husbandman in Matthew 21. Behold the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. You read of the early and latter rain all through the Old Testament. It took both of those for them to have a crop in the agricultural nature of their lifestyle. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. In other words, it's always night. We don't know when he's coming. He'll come as a thief in the night. Matthew 25 and Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 5 too. In other words, he'll come suddenly as a thief in the night. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And later in this chapter, he's going to talk about the patience of Job and then comment on what that is. You count them happy who endure. So the Bible definition of patience is endurance. It doesn't mean that you patiently let people run over you or you patiently wait to obey the Lord. That's not the point. He's talking about you need to be a Christian and endure as a Christian. You need to be a servant of God and endure in that profession of faith. And so uh, it doesn't always mean she's such a patient person, meaning put up with anything and everything. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standing before the door. Or you ought to live in such a way as to realize that right outside that door, the judge standing. Standing. Then he hears what you say, knows what you're doing. He'll come suddenly for judgment. And if you're unprepared, guess whose fault it'll be? 
Behold, we count them happy endure, who endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, that is, uh, full of much pity, and of tender mercy. Now, when I grew up, I heard people talk about the patience of Job, and I read the book of Job and saw that he wasn't what we call patient. He often replied against God, but he did endure. And so the Bible view of patience is endurance. Uh, really, the book of Job teaches the patience of God with Job. He's the one who had to be patient. And finally, Job got it right and said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13, 15. And though he once said, I cried unto God, and he didn't hear me. Job 30, verse 20. The last paragraph of his book, God blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Job 42, 12. So in the Bible, the Bible view ultimately of patience is endurance. We may have rough spots and rocky days. There may be times when we're in despair and even in doubt. But the Word of God draws us back Sort of like when I did what I shouldn't have done. The teaching of my mother and dad drew me back. The friendship and fellowship of Christians. The opportunity to worship in the assembly of the saints drew me back. I had some rough times and some bad days, as most of us did. But I'm not excusing mine because you had some too. I'm just saying what drew me back. The love of God. The patience of God. The loveliness of my parents who didn't give up on me, though I saddened them. And they were not reluctant to tell me that. I'm glad I gave them a few years of joy by being a gospel preacher that they wanted me to be. But the point is, we have to live in such a way that when rocky, rough days come, through them we can march victoriously because of the background and the solid teaching we received that never left us. And that made us ashamed when we did leave it. I believe that uh, train up a child in a way he should go when he's old and not depart from it. If you read the whole context, it has a couple of applications. But one thing I think he's saying is if those who go astray ever come back, it'll be because of the solid teaching and life of their parents. They cannot forget it. Again, the story that I told about a year or so ago, a true story of an elder in Kentucky uh, that read the letter of withdrawal from his own son on behalf of the congregation. The other elder said, let us do it. He said, no. I want to do it. And while his son was in the assembly, he read the letter of withdrawal from that son, and the son stormed out of the building. About six or eight years later, he came back. Same son walked down the aisle and said, if my dad hadn't had the courage and backbone to do that, I don't believe I ever would have come back. But I left as a rebel and come back humbly, penitently, because he practiced what he preached. It took a while for that father to rejoice. But he sowed the seed that drew the son back. And also what he and his wife had taught the son through the years. To me, that's a great success story. And that congregation will never forget the day that that withdrawn from lad came back home and had the courage to say, had my dad not had the courage to do that, I would never be back here today. So we have to endure. We have to do what's right regardless of circumstances and pray that before eternity rolls around, good will be accomplished. Then he comes to the controversial part of the book, and in the outline we gave you our manuscript about a year or so ago when we studied James verse by verse, we have a page and a half just on these difficult matters. But let's just read it, and then I'll sum up what I believe it says, and then you search the Scripture, see if it's so. Is any sick among you, verse 14, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, what is he talking about there? I believe there's only one possible answer to that in context, in concert with the rest of the Bible. This had to be in the days of miraculous gifts. Because when this process was followed, it never failed. The Lord shall raise him up. There's a time when miraculous gifts were given, and if anyone in the congregation would have them, or should it be the elders, call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil. And he goes on to say, he shall be lifted up, shall be raised, shall be healed. Had to be in the days of miraculous gifts. And the purpose of that was to confirm the word. And now we have all the word confirmed, Mark 16, verse 20, through these miracles. So if this process was followed, it never failed. Have to be in the days of miraculous gifts. 
Some people say that uh, the anointing with oil was for, ne for medicinal purposes. Uh, boy, let me have a barrel of that oil and I'd be a multi-billionaire. I could sell it for $10,000 a cup or a drop. Has to be in the context of miraculous gifts which were given to confirm the word. And don't you know in a community of beef, passed around quickly. Do you know what happened? Here came those elders again with that oil and they anointed him and he was healed. He was raised up. But one thing we've noticed, if he have committed sins, they should be forgiven him. So that dispels the idea that many people have that only those who are sinful get sick. Uh, that won't work because it says if he have committed sins. So uh, we need to learn how to read each word and analyze what is being said. I do not believe that any other answer to those three verses works than the one we've given. I've heard all the different kinds of answers. I just don't believe it works. This is a foolproof method in the days of miraculous gifts. And that was the purpose of miraculous gifts, to confirm the word. We have all the word confirmed today, so we don't need that. It doesn't apply. Confess your faults one to another. The Catholics have what they call auricular confession, where... The parishioner goes in this little booth over here and he talks into the ear of the priest on the other side and that's where you get auricular confession. And notice though it says confess your faults one to another. Never heard of a priest in Catholic lore confessing his sins and evidently a bunch of them have a lot of them to the other person, you know. It's ridiculous how people don't even know how to read. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so we need to pray effectually, fervently, and be righteous. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the pace of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Read of that in the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapters 16, 17, 18, 19. And so who was in charge of uh, crops and productivity? Baal and Ashtaroth, the gods that uh, Ahab and Jezebel introduced in Israel? No. They were not the god and goddess of vegetation. Jehovah God, Elijah's father in heaven, was in charge of that. So he's saying you're in touch as a Christian with the magnificent power of a heavenly father. And prayer is more powerful than any tool the world's ever invented. Sometimes people say, well, why do we pray? I pray because God told me to. And he made me and he knows what's best for me. I don't mind telling you, I pray because I'm selfish enough to want to be blessed by the contact I have with my Heavenly Father. I believe there's power in prayer. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in every time of need. Hebrews 4.16 This is the confidence we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. 1 John 5.14 I pray because the Bible tells me to and the Bible tells me of the fruitfulness of prayer, the productivity of prayer. If nothing else, as the world would say it, I pray for the psychological lift it gives me. And there is such thing as Bible psychology, not human psychology. But God who made me knows what's best for me. I pray to stay in contact with my Creator. And I pray because if I ask according to His will, blessings ensue. But I pray not my will but thine be done. That might be the most important thing we could ever say in prayer. Not my will but thine be done. Even Jesus prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Thy will be done. We sing, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I'm yielded and still. And we no sooner sang the last word of that song till we're back on the same agenda, I'll do it my way. That's what's wrong with the world today. Everybody does his own thing, his own way, and then wonders why God doesn't bless him in the world. We have a lot of people scattered around the world who think they're in high places of power. They don't have any power at all. God rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4.25. Oh, they may have earthly power, but they have no power to sway men there is a God in heaven Daniel 2.28 he does but little old puny manufactured elected potentates zero in their power as far as heavenly power and eternal power is concerned they come and go they rise and wane they live and die and pass on and someone takes their place but God still rules in the kingdoms of men 
Then the last two verses tell us, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, I, call, I thought you couldn't err from the truth once you were a brother. I thought that 80% of the creeds of men and denominationalism around us today right here in this town teach you can't fall from grace. He said, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he that converts a sinner, a saint can become a sinner. Let him know that he converts a sinner from the error of his way, shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. You and I can do the greatest evangelistic work in the history of the world. We can help save others. Paul, read 1 Timothy 4.16 for us as our last parting word. 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul, who was a father in the gospel to Timothy, wrote to his son in the gospel. And notice what he said to this Christian. Last verse of 1 Timothy 4. Take heed unto thyself, under the doctrine, continuing them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Christ is the ultimate Savior, but I can be your Savior and you can be mine. I can stand in the role of Savior by bringing you back to the Lord. I must first take heed to myself. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. So we have some erring brethren. We need to exhort them every day lest they be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And if every congregation would do that religiously, constantly, we could bring the lost ones back and save an erring brother's soul from death and hide the multitude of sins. But where are the members that care enough about other members to do that? What a practical book. What a useful book. Come on through the door, boys and girls. I heard you knocking. Tonight, 1 Timothy 6. Be sure and read that before you come back tonight.